Okay, so so far in our story of the cardiac action potential, we've had the initial depolarization of our cardiomyocyte, which occurs because sodium ions are moving in from the neighboring cardiomyocyte, which is undergoing an action potential, through the gap junctions, which connect the two cells electrically. That initial depolarization activated our voltage-gated sodium channels, which were specifically of the NAV 1.5 type. That allowed sodium to enter the cell through these voltage-gated sodium channels, and that caused this rapid depolarization of the uh, electrical potential difference across the cell membrane, which we call phase zero of the cardiac action potential. Then the voltage-gated sodium channels close. And what happens is the initial, some, at some point in phase zero, when we were rapidly depolarizing the cell, certain potassium channels became activated. These KV1.4 homotetramers and these KV4.2-4.3 heterotetramers became active. And they are going to open and allow the movement of potassium out of the cell. Uh, so that's going to move positive charge out of the cell, and it's going to repolarize the membrane. However, these channels are open for a pathetically short period of time, so they don't do that much. They repolarize it a little bit to around zero millivolts, but they don't massively repolarize it. Okay, and then they close. So. It's now time to discuss the voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay, so the next star of this show is going to be voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay, so we need to discuss these now. So we'll put these in red because they're important. Okay, so this is a voltage-gated calcium channel, and I don't think it would be fair on the voltage-gated calcium channel if we didn't discuss its structure in as much detail as we've discussed the voltage-gated sodium and voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay, so over the page, sorry, vo yes, voltage-gated potassium and voltage-gated sodium are the ones we've discussed. Right, so if this is the cell membrane here, then again we'll draw this big circular structure to denote our pore forming unit of the voltage-gated so, uh, calcium channel. Because voltage-gated calcium channels actually aren't just one protein. They have a huge number of auxiliary subunits, which I'll add on in a moment. But we'll start with the actual pore forming subunit, because that's the arguably most important one. In fact, it, not arguably, it is the most important one. It's the one that actually conducts the calcium through. Okay, now it's very similar to the voltage-gated sodium channel. It is one protein, okay, one protein, but it has four domains. Domain 1, domain 2, domain 3, and domain 4, okay, here. And by the way, this is the voltage-gated calcium channel we're now discussing, the VGCC. Okay, so it has these four domains, and basically the membrane-spanning topology of this protein that makes up this pore-forming subunit is exactly the same as the membrane-spanning topology of the protein that makes up the voltage-gated sodium channel. So this topology is exactly what you have in the case of the voltage-gated calcium channel. You have these four domains, and it's exactly the same. You have these S1 to S6 uh, membrane spanning regions and a P loop. So it's basically exactly the same as the pore forming unit of the voltage gated sodium channel. So that's nice. Okay, now um, what's different between the voltage gated calcium channel and the voltage gated sodium channel? Well, firstly, it's permeable to calcium rather than sodium, but also you have a lot more subunits attached to the voltage gated calcium channel than you do to the voltage gated sodium channel. So, this subunit, now the pore forming subunit, is called not the alpha subunit this time, it's called the alpha 1 subunit. Okay, so, and this is um, demonstrating that there's going to be a lot more auxiliary subunits attached to this than there are to the voltage gated sodium channel. Now, uh, before we discuss the, actually, we'll discuss the auxiliary subunits now. So the auxiliary subunits that modulate the function of the voltage-gated calcium channel. Here is one, the gamma subunit, stuck on the side of the alpha-1 subunit. Here is another one, the beta subunit, which specifically is stuck 
onto the loop connecting the first domain to the second domain. So if I go over and show this on the drawing here, there is this loop between the S6 of the first domain and the S1 of the second domain here. Okay, and this loop is on the intracellular aspect of the membrane. And this is where this beta subunit of the voltage-gated calcium channel is going to bind to the alpha-1 subunit of the voltage-gated calcium channel. So there's the beta subunit. And finally, there's another subunit here, which we'll draw like this, a box on the end of a stick, uh, which is known as the alpha-2 delta subunit. So this is the alpha-2 delta subunit. And really, it's made up of two subunits. This is the alpha-2 subunit here. And it's connected to this stick here, which is the delta subunit, by disulfide bonds. So you might wonder, well, why is it not just called two subunits stuck together? Well, complicatedly, it has the last laugh. It's actually made by one gene. One gene makes one protein. And then that protein is cleaved into two portions, the alpha-2 and the delta portion. And then they join back together in a different way, basically. So it's, it's very convoluted. Okay, so we'll draw the alpha-2 delta subunit in this turquoise colour here. Okay, there we go. Okay, so the delta subunit is the stick that spans the membrane, and the alpha-2 subunit is the box at the top. Okay, we'll draw the beta subunit in blue here. Okay. Oh, whoops, I'm just going to finish that off. And then we'll draw the gamma subunit in pink over here, vivid pink. Okay, right, now... These are other subunits just modulate its function. The real thing that controls the properties of this voltage-gated calcium channel is the alpha-1 subunit. And there are multiple genes for the alpha-1 subunit. Okay, So there are 10 genes in the human genome for alpha-1 subunits, so slightly simpler than potassium channels. Okay, And these genes, again, are divided into families. So you divide them into three families, the CAV1 family, the CAV2 family, and the CAV3 family, okay? Um, so the CAV1 family has four genes within it, the CAV1.1 all the way down to the CAV1.4 genes. You have CAV1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, and those are all genes. So there's four genes. The CAV2 family has CAV2.1 all the way down to CAV2.2, uh, sorry, 2.3 rather. So it has three genes in there, CAV2.1, CAV2.2, CAV2.3. And finally, the CAV3 family has three genes in there, CAV3.1 all the way down to CAV3.3. Now, which of these genes is important in the cardiac muscle cells? Well, actually, that's a bad question because diff in different cardiac muscle cells, differing voltage-gated calcium channels are important. If we were talking about the sinoatrial node, the CAV freeze would be extremely important, but we're not. We're talking about a, a normal old myocardiocyte. Um, so uh, this is the important family, the CAV1 family. Now, this has these four genes, and if you use one of these four genes in the CAV1 family to make your alpha-1 subunit, okay, of your voltage-gated calcium channel, then your voltage-gated calcium channel is named an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. So I'll repeat that because it's worth repeating. There are these four genes that are in this CAV1 family. If you use any one of them for your alpha-1 subunit when you're building a voltage-gated calcium channel, then that voltage-gated calcium channel will be named an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. So it's named after what alpha-1 subunit you use, not what the uh, auxiliary subunits are, demonstrating further how important the alpha-1 subunit is. Okay. Right, so now we've discussed these voltage-gated calcium channels, let's discuss their importance in the cardiac action potential. Okay, so, basically, these voltage-gated calcium channels, again, they are activated to open by depolarization. So, they will be activated to open somewhere in phase zero, basically. However, they are extremely slow to open. 
So they have not managed to open until we get to around this point here. So they're really, really slow. They were activated to open back here, but they were clunking away, getting ready, and it took them a very long time to get to the point where they were actually open. Okay, but once they are open, what are they going to do? Well, again, I'll give you clues here. The concentration of calcium extracellularly is around 1.5 millimolar, which looks pretty pathetic when you compare it to 145 millimolar of sodium concentration. But let me tell you the calcium concentration intracellularly before you judge the extracellular concentration. The concentration intracellularly is 100 nanomolar, okay? That is 15,000 times smaller than the extracellular calcium concentration. When you compare that gradient to the gradients of sodium and to the gradients of potassium, it's phenomenal, the size of that concentration gradient. Okay, so we don't even need to look at the electrical potential difference across this membrane. Uh, when you open that voltage-gated calcium channel, what is going to happen? Calcium is going to come into your cell because it's 15,000 times more likely to hit from the extracellular aspect and go through into the inside than it is to than it is for one to hit from the intracellular side and go through into the extracellular side. So just the concentration gradient, it can't be beaten by electrical gradients, not at physiological levels anyway. Okay, so you're going to start bringing calcium ions into the cell. Now those calcium ions, they carry a positive charge. So they're again going to raise the electrical potential of uh, the intracellular compartment and lower the electrical potential of the extracellular compartment because we're moving them out of the extracellular compartment. And in fact, calcium ions carry a divalent positive charge, so they're twice as good at doing this. So you're going to raise the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment and you're also going to lower the electrical potential of the extracellular compartment. So this is going up, this is becoming less positive, so you're taking a more positive number and subtracting off a less positive number. This is going to get more positive, you would think. But in fact, what's going to happen at this next stage is a plateau. You're just going to sort of stay at around zero millivolts for quite a while, actually. So let me highlight this up in green. This is known as the plateau phase, okay? Or it's known as phase two. Phase two. I can't say that without thinking of uh, Sir Desmond Glazebrook out of um, out of Yes Minister saying that's scheduled for phase two. Okay, um, so. Um, this is, in fact, he might have said that schedule for phase three. Anyways, this is called the plateau phase. Okay, so plateau phase. Right, so what causes this plateau phase? Why haven't we gone zooming back up, depolarized? We surely should have, because we've let in calcium. Well, it's because you don't just open voltage-gated calcium channels of the L-type in this next phase of the action potential you also open more voltage-gated potassium channels. So I'll draw these voltage-gated potassium channels here. Okay, so we'll colour these in. Uh, we probably should colour them in turquoise again because they're potassium channels, so we should probably stick to the colour we'd used over there. Now, these ones have opened later than those ones, so they're different types of voltage-gated potassium channels. And these potassium channels that open now are what are known as the delayed rectifier potassium channels. So these are the delayed rectifier potassium channels. And this is because they took a much longer time to open than those ones over there. So they again are going to be activated in phase zero. But they, just like these voltage-gated calcium channels, they're going to sort of clunk along and take a while to open. And they're just opening at the same time as these voltage-gated calcium channels. And basically, what these delayed rectifier potassium channels are going to do is they're going to allow potassium to move out of the cell. And this movement of positive charge out of the cell in the form of the potassium will balance the movement of positive charge into the cell through the L-type uh, voltage-gated calcium channels in the form of calcium. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.